Hi, my name's Andrew Harvey. I'm a principal program manager for Microsoft for Startups. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about architecting your startup stack. We think a lot about architectures, and often they're really big architectures and enterprise architectures. But even in a startup, it's really important to think about how you're architecting the product that you're building. And so today, we're going to talk through a few things to help you do that. We're going to start off by talking through the stages of a startup and stages of innovation. And we're going to use those to help us drive the architectures that we're going to make. We're going to talk a little bit about some technologies and some tools. And then I'm going to show you a little bit of something that we've created for you so that you can maybe get started and see how things can go together. So let's get into it. Let's talk about some startup stages. Now, startup stages are important because knowing where you are helps you know what you need to do. And so thinking about the stage you're at is going to help you understand what kind of architecture you want to build and how you want to focus on that. So what I want to start off with when we talk about stages is maybe some graphs. I love graphs. And I think everyone in startups kind of likes this graph. Everyone loves a hockey stick. It's that great up and to the right feeling. Now, the problem is your x-axis is always going to be time, and that's always moving on. So the only thing you control is heading up. But of course, I've seen a lot of these graphs in pitch decks and that kind of thing. And they honestly are the Instagram selfie of graphs in startups. They don't really tell you the whole picture. And it doesn't really tell you all of the work that goes into creating something great, creating a great startup. So the bad news is, is that the hockey stick is only part of the picture. But it's also good news, because understanding this whole progression that your startup takes is going to help you make better choices at every stage. It's very true as engineers that we can get focused on building the thing, writing the code, keeping it running. And we don't look around at the context of the business that we're in. And being able to do that is going to make a, help us make better decisions as we architect our startup stack. So get used to this curve, get acquainted with it. We're going to get into it a little bit more. So a gentleman called Kent Beck described these three stages of innovation. And it really maps well to this sigmoid curve that we've got here. He starts off with explore, and then expand and extract. And these help us understand the different stages that a startup goes through. So let's start off with explore. Explore is really that stage where it's early on, when you haven't yet found product market fit, or even problem solution fit, where you're trying to find out what works in market. Now, when we're exploring, we're really trying to test ideas. We're trying to find what's going to fit. And so that's what we need to optimize for with our architecture. Really, it's about finding what works, but quickly. Because every moment we spend here, we're not doing the scaling that we really want to be doing. So we want to try our ideas quickly. We want to understand what works and truly understand what works. And we need to be ready to scale or pivot. Scale if things are working and we've found the right thing, or pivot if we realize that we haven't. And that leads us to the second stage of innovation, and that's expansion. What we want to do here when we're expanding is we want to be able to acknowledge that the things that we did before were good, but we need to do more to keep on moving and to keep on scaling. What got us here won't get us there, if you will. What we need to do is we need to, re we need to reduce any friction for growth. We need to take the engineering decisions that we've previously made that might have been good at the time, or maybe they weren't, and we need to re-look at those and reassess them so that we can scale and we can grow with our business. We need to eliminate scaling bottlenecks. We need to be able to find them and eliminate them quickly. And we need to spend time investing in and developing our architecture and processes to enable the scale that we want to have. The final stage is one that we call extract. It's really about stabilizing and getting ready for the next round. Now, this is not one that, that we really encounter that much in startups. It is really more of a thing that we encounter in mature businesses. If you have reached the point of extraction, Microsoft has a wonderful slew of people who can help you out. But really, when we're talking about startups, it's very much about those explore and expand stages. But just for completeness sake, what we're doing in that extract stage is we're increasing operational efficiency. 
What we want to do is we want to consolidate the position we have and reduce risk. The game has changed from trying to find what works, from we know it does, and we want to keep it working. We want to defend against competition, and you know what? The great thing is the way we get there is by spinning out more and new ideas and returning to that exploration stage. So, how do we use these business stages to help us drive our architectures? Well, I want to talk just about the explore and the expand stages and some of the things that we can do and some of the tools that we can use to be able to drive that architecture with that business stage. Now, we've said that exploration is about testing these hypotheses and testing these ideas. And so what we need to optimize for when we're exploring is for speed, for cost, and options. So when we're thinking about speed, what we want to do is be able to have fast iteration. We want to be able to test one idea, then the next, then the next, as most of our ideas just unfortunately aren't going to be the greatest. We need to be able to test and we need to be able to move quickly through those tests. So in that case, simple beats complex. It's far better for us to have a simple architecture that allows us to quickly move to the next thing than over-investing in a complex architecture which is going to limit us. We want to optimize for developer velocity because in the end, it's the developers that are creating these different ideas. They are bringing them into the world and we need to allow them to move quickly. So choosing the tools correctly and optimizing our architectures for developer velocity is very important at this point. Now, the second thing that we want to think about when we're exploring is cost. We want to avoid overinvestment, not just in terms of, of monetary investment, but also in terms of time investment. So we don't want to spend a whole lot of time because honestly, your payroll is going to be far greater than your cloud bill at this point. You want to be thinking about that. You want to be thinking about the time you're spending and, and that your people are spending. But if you're thinking about services as well and your architecture, you want to think about how much do you really need? How many customers do you really have at this stage? How much, or even better, how little can you spend to test these ideas? And then you want to be able to scale on demand. You don't want to, to have a whole lot of resources allocated that you're not using. And you also don't want to get caught out. So be ready to scale on demand and choose services wisely for that. The third thing you want to do is you want to optimize for options. You want to give yourself options and not paint yourself into a corner with an architecture. Often, when we build sophisticated and really robust architectures, they can lead us down a certain pathway. And the problem with doing this at the explore stage is we don't quite yet know where we're going. And so you want to allow for divergent exploration and you need to make choices in your architecture that allow you to do that. You want to avoid tunnel vision that is going to restrict you and restrict your ability to take a good idea that you might find and run with it into expansion. So what about expansion? What do we need to optimize for when we are building our architectures when we're expanding? Well, scalability is probably number one in everyone's mind. But also security and observability become really important as we hit this stage because the game changes and we need to think a little bit differently about what we're doing. So, scalability. Now, there's lots of ways to approach scale, but I think for us, as we're expanding, the best thing to think about is being able to scale in small increments. That means choosing services and instance sizes that allow you to take little bits and add them together rather than having huge monolithic changes. So scale in small in increments and embrace asynchrony. As you split out into microservices, which is often what happens at this expand stage, you want to be able to have services talk to each other asynchronously, which is going to allow you to massively increase your performance without necessarily having to spend a huge amount of money. The third thing that you want to think about when you're scaling is not just scaling your infrastructure, but also your team. What's probably happening as you're expanding is that you've hired a whole bunch more developers and you can't have them all working on one code base all at the same time. Things are probably starting to split apart. And so you want to think about how do you scale ownership of services and even micro architectures themselves to different people within your team. So that's important when you're thinking about architecture at this stage. Now, we want to think about security as well. Security is always important, but especially at the stage where, where you're expanding, you're becoming a bigger target, and it's really important to have this front of mind. 
my main recommendation to a lot of startups is buy, don't build. If, if security is not your primary competency, you really want to be able to bring in expertise. And the best way to do that is buy that and using products which are trusted. So whether it's products like Azure Sentinel or maybe investing more in identity services using Azure Active Directory, think about using those rather than building your own. The second thing you want to do is choose your tolerance level. There are lots of ways to spend a lot of money building an incredibly secure infrastructure, which is potentially not necessary for the industry that you're in. If you're in a high regulation environment, then yes, you need to invest heavily in this. But finding that tolerance and that risk level is really important for doing this well. The third thing that is really going to help you out is thinking about zero trust services. Perhaps in the explore stage, the way that you did service authentication was maybe a little bit mm, fast and loose. As we head into this stage of expansion, as you are a bigger target, you really want to think about how your services are interacting and really working towards zero trust networking so that even if one thing gets breached, you actually manage to restrict the damage and the blast radius of that kind of thing. Now, finally, for the expand stage, you really want to think about observability. You want to find your bottlenecks early. And to do that, you need to have a good vision over what's going on inside your stack. You want to have good vision for what your users are doing and where the load is. And so investing in observability at the stage can be really valuable. You want to ex enable exploration by finding the different things that are happening inside your stack and the different ways that your user, users are using your products. And you also want to be able to expect the unexpected. And a good observability system allows you to see ahead of what's happening rather than having problems come to you when they're already on fire. So those are the things that we're optimizing for the when we're architecting. What are the tools and the technologies that we can use that are really going to allow us to do this the best? Well, when we're exploring, there's three services that I really love to lean on. The first is Azure App Service, which allows you to really quickly and, and easily deploy applications in a multitude of different languages into a really robust environment that scales well. Azure Static Web Apps lets you take your React or Vue or other static website and get it deployed really quickly using GitHub Actions for continuous integration. And I'm really excited about Azure Container Apps. It allows you to build great microservices infrastructure without having to worry about all of the things that come with standing up your own Kubernetes. So that's exploring. What about expanding? It's actually remarkably similar. And that's what you want. You want services that are going to last with you the whole way through. Think about app service again and container apps, but maybe adding into those, thinking about really taking control of your identity services using Azure Active Directory, and also really optimizing your observability using Azure Monitor. There are more services than these that you can use. Obviously, Azure has a plethora, and there are others all around that you can use. But think about the services you use and how they fit into the stage that you're in. Now, I've talked a lot. I want to show you some things. I would like to show you the startup stack that we have developed for you so that you can see how we might approach this kind of problem. Let's have a look now. So this is our core startup stack repository. This is where we've taken an app. And it's a Ruby on Rails app, because that's my background. And I've taken that, and I've set it up in such a way that it is going to create an infrastructure and an architecture that allows me to quickly scale, so to optimize for all of the things that I've talked about before. Now, in terms of startup stages, this is probably heading towards that expansion stage. This is maybe not what, something that I would recommend to you if you're just trying to start out an experiment. But as you're looking for something more robust, this can be really helpful to think about. We integrate systems like Azure CDN, App Service, Azure da Database for PostgreSQL, and bring it all together using Bicep for infrastructure as code and GitHub Actions for continuous integration. This repository includes all the files you need and all of the instructions for deploying this stack and hopefully to get you started to deploy your own stack in a similar way. You'll go through, you'll create service principles, and you'll eventually have a fully fledged uh, continuous integration stack that will allow you to deploy not just your application code, but also redeploy your infrastructure with every commit. 
I want to highlight a couple of things for you in here. The first thing is that we've used Docker really extensively. We've used containers really extensively for applications, and that's for a couple of reasons. The first is it allows us to have those options. It allows us to take our, our application between different services. Maybe you might start out on app service and move to container apps. Maybe you, you want to move towards Kubernetes in the long term, but having that core in containers is really going to help you out. The other thing that we've done is, is we've extensively used BICEP. Now, BICEP is a language that allows you to write really robust and powerful infrastructure as code, basically the blueprint for your infrastructure. Now, our BICEP template will take a couple of parameters from you and put them together and create your infrastructure with just one command. And in fact, you don't even have to worry about the command once you've got it set up. GitHub Actions will continue to deploy this BICEP template for you. And what that will do is we'll deploy your virtual network, your private DNS zones, your app service, your database, and all of those, and put them together so you don't have to think about it which is really important because, again, we're talking about developer velocity. You don't want your developers worrying about, oh, how do I connect to this database or how do I expose this? It's all done for you in this template. So have a look at that and see how that helps you. If you do have issues, we would love for you to raise a GitHub issue and for us to start a conversation about that and to help you scale your architecture. So if you're interested, have a look. Go to aka.ms slash startup stack, and you can see all the code that we have there. You can see how we're deploying it, and you can even see our own continuous integration pipeline. So hopefully this has been helpful for you, and you can use these business stages to better architect your startup stack based on where you are at. My name is Andrew Harvey, and I'm really excited to see what you build.